All right, well, welcome everyone to another episode of Brain Health Office Hours. I'm Dr. Julie Fratton-Tony, and I'm excited today to have Dr. Jennifer Huberty with us. Um, yeah, there's so much to say, but we're not gonna spend a ton of time with formal introductions and just kind of wanna dive in, but um, I'll also, I'll let you both kind of briefly introduce yourselves. Well, I'm Dan Krawczyk. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist also, PhD here at the center and also the deputy director here. So I'm involved in many aspects of research and my specific areas of interest are decision-making and reasoning. It's pretty good, pretty, pretty <laughs> to the point. I'm in pressure now. I'm Jennifer Huberty and I'm actually a fractional chief science officer. Um, I spent 20 years in academics um, as a research scientist and I've spent the last 10 years in industry and kind of emerging um, science and business, if you will, and helping uh, businesses be successful by using science to empower themselves. Awesome. So I'll kick off the topic with kind of your background is in exercise physiology, and you've done a ton with behavioral science, behavior change, habit formation, using technology to do that in various forms, whether that be text messages or using apps. Um, and so, yeah, would you just, I guess, talk about some of the maybe, you know, misnomers or when it comes to forming habits, what are some things that people, what are some do's and don'ts? Oh, geez, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, well, I guess it depends on, on what it is that, what's the behavior and how you're, how you're going about it. But generally speaking, in terms of behaviors, let's say physical activity or even eating behaviors, there's certain uh, strategies that everybody tends to do better with. So for example, social support. It's very clear in the literature that social support is very important in terms of changing behaviors. And so when you get into like digital interventions and those kinds of things, they don't, they lack that, that component. And so there's some challenge there with um, that translation. Um, another thing that's really important for behavior change is being able to understand the benefits of what someone is doing. So there needs to be clear education and knowledge about why should I be doing this? Because that helps with overcoming barriers that people come across. So I think most of us probably at some point in our lives have thought about exercise or physical activity and come up with a lot of things like time, motivation, resources and in, in terms of why we don't do them and if we can really focus on the benefit and why we want to be doing it it helps us overcome the barrier although we do need assistance with plans to overcome the barrier um, and then maybe the third thing i would say for top three is goal setting and that helps with overcoming barriers um, setting goals that are um, specific measurable realistic time sensitive, um, we, you know, we don't want to wake up one day and say, I'm running a marathon tomorrow, right? Like it doesn't make much sense. But like, first I could just take a 30 minute walk today, right? And so then it's a, a, a very specific goal and um, you attain that goal, you build confidence to set another goal, attain that goal, et cetera. So that, that would be three strategies, I guess. I love that. Um, Dan, do you want to speak to, I know the, just the first point of even mm. the social motivation and just how the brain is wired, why that's such a um, motivating factor. Absolutely. So I, I can relate to that entirely. When I was in college, I had a roommate and we would go to the gym about five times a week, maybe seven. If we had a cold, maybe maybe we get six. So we were just really committed. Mm -hmm. And that that sort of accountability factor, I think, was one of the things that made exercise stick at the time for me. And so I, I was a little dogmatic about it, but then it, it, it enabled me to kind of build a habit. And that was actually a question I had for you um, regarding habits, because I, I think you described kind of this, the forces that, that pull you away from the gym or, or exercising or running um, are, are ever present. But if you can kind of, uh, it's almost like a hill where once you sort of build it into your life enough, it actually, you start going downhill where it's the automatic thing to do is, is to exercise. And I've heard a variety of, of people describe the length of time that it takes to build a habit. 
And so I was curious your thoughts on this. Some people talk of the basal ganglia habit learning system. I don't think we have to get that deep in the physiology. And I know nothing. You know, about that's that. a lab based. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just a, sort of a lab based. You know, really rigorously, what makes for a habit, and it. I think it is important at the level of of exercise. What what's enough to kind of push you? Uh, into that downhill phase where it becomes automatic. Um, I think social support being one of those potentiators that really helps you move in that direction. Yeah, I mean, as far as habit goes, I think one of the biggest things is if you already have something that you do every day that doesn't take much, you know, brain effort, if you will, like you don't have to think about it. Like hopefully all of us get up every day and brush our teeth without thinking about it, right? Um, so. So it's like, okay, that's, that's just a habit. We just do that. And so if you can attach a behavior like exercise or meditation or eating breakfast regularly to the habit of brushing your teeth or whatever it is, then it's like it follows suit of something you're already doing. So it's like tacking it on to the end. Um, I think there's definitely science to, to, to support that. Um, and I know in working with some of the mindfulness um, companies, you know, we always suggest that people identify a habit and then latch on the mindfulness piece to the end of that habit. So the same thing can happen with exercise, but I think one, one part of that is that you really have to think about, well, what's best suited also for my lifestyle and like this notion of overcoming barriers like I expressed. It's like if the morning time, in my case, I'm, I have two children that have to get off to school. So it's either 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the morning, or it's going to be in the evening when they're at sports. Like those are my only two options. And so that can almost be habit forming, if you will. It's like I drop them off and I go work out. I drop them off and I go work out. You know, so so but you you have to really ask yourself like what is the habit that i already have that i already do that i'm consistent at that's going to work best for me not just assuming that oh i should do it right away when i wake up um it's also like the other thing is about that is like um you should be setting habits to something that you enjoy and like to do not something that you think you should be doing so it's like going to the gym i should be going to the gym but it's like well you could go for a walk outside in nature you go roller skating you could go play tennis like it should be something that you're going to want to do as well so it's like if there's a combination of things happening um it's funny because habit is a very if if i can say sexy thing right now but like there's so many other components to it right like um, you know, behavioral strategies that have been around for years that play a role in the success of it, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, I'm going to jump back to the social motivation, and you said we kind of, you lose that when you go virtual or with technology a little bit. What are some ways that you can kind of build that in or th- things, strategies you've seen successful to kind of fill that void? Mm-hmm. I would say that we don't know what strategies are successful yet. We really don't know. I don't think the literature's clear. I don't think we've, we've, we haven't had enough studies. Um, I know I've done some work with discussion boards and you know, Facebook support groups and um, you know, a facilitator who gets on there and asks questions. And it's interesting because in those situations, even though people say, I want support, what they end up doing is reading what's on the Facebook pages and never typing like it's like 10 to 20 percent of the sample will actually engage and the rest they report they enjoyed reading what everybody else had to write but they didn't participate at all so from a research side we're like okay nobody's participating but they are they're reading it we just don't know Mm -hmm. it right yeah so so that would be like one example that you know people are are at least reading and looking at it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, social media can be supportive in the sense of like, you know, posting something and getting feedback. But again, like, I don't know, again, the the science isn't clear, so I can't say anything about the science. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't sit right to me because I feel like if everyone in this room right now told me, good job, Jen, for working out this morning, and I, I, they, you know, they knew I worked out. Like, Wouldn't it be oh. a great world if we all did that? Oh, <laughs> wouldn't it, though? But, like, okay, all, all these people say that. I w- like, what, 10 people? I'd be like, oh, wow, 10 people said that to me. But in social media, 10 people, 
gosh, nobody supported me. Nobody even saw my comment. Why am I even doing this? So it's like, it's very counter, mm. like it just, mm -hmm. it's back and forth. And so uh, I'm, like I said, the, the, the jury is still out on this, on how to do this um, social component. It's like, we want to be remote workers, but then we miss being at work. So it's like, pick one, people. <laughs> you know, so it, we, ha we really have a lot of work to do on how do we bring that social component, the accountability yeah. um, in a digital world. I was talking to, she's a behavioral scientist. She's at Meta now. And one of the things oh. she's looking at is how to translate like kind of like the chat feature or like what does it look like in real life to then be virtual and I guess it just makes what you're just saying makes me think it's just not a one-to-one -one. like 10 people saying something in real life does not equate to getting 10 likes or 10 you know online um, and how you figure out yeah what those ratios are I think that's gonna be really interesting um, people are trying to figure it out and I, I just don't know that I don't know that it will ever fill that same gap um, yeah. And I don't know, like, on the mental health and brain side, like, obviously not exactly my area, but, like, you know, they're, they're showing that, you know, like, teenagers are looking at these things and valuing themselves on them. And it is not conducive to positive mental health. It's why my 13-year-old does not have access to any social media at all whatsoever. I refuse to allow him to base his self-esteem on that. He needs to work on his own self-esteem before I let him out to the wolves right and yeah. so like if you think about mental health and brain health like that's going to impact what's happening and it is we we know it. Yeah. I mean it's like everyone's like oh ever since COVID mental health is a disaster no 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 it was way before COVID we're mm -hmm. just now because it's increased so you know so exponentially it's like ah oh, we're paying attention but it's been around for a long time it's like everything in COVID it's it sort of exacerbated existing problems right. that were already there I that's think right. that's that's correct having raised children through sort of this digital age you just would long for them to have face-to-face -face interactions and any any excuse for them to be outdoors with other kids is like wow this is just amazing and I, I, I go to to face processing is one of the keys to that without without the face reactivity you know so much that we learn from the face when someone mm -hmm. sort of perks up when they show interest mm -hmm. and, and that ability to kind of read the room you know read mm -hmm. where when you're um, striking a chord with someone or where they're disagreeing you just don't get that online effectively in real time and so it starts to be this very filtered interaction that doesn't mm -hmm. have all the com components that we mm -hmm. we would have in a in a face to face. Mm -hmm. I know um, one of the professors on main campus was really interested in learning how that is changing the brain and kind of understanding there theirs was more from I think an artistic like sensory development perspective of just kids, you know, being in school and having online learning and then what is it what are they you know, lacking to develop in certain areas in terms of just m not getting all those different inputs. Um, it's like just this flat, you know, <laughs> 2D thing instead of kind of having just these multimodalities. And um, anyway, I think in the coming years will be really interesting to see what types of research are, are going to come out from that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. Jen, I wanted to ask, in having worked in the meditation space, I, I wonder if you could just summarize what what some of the main effects are and what kind of data you find valuable you, you're in a unique position of really understanding data and also understanding sort of the the app delivery and and the the practice and so um your advice could be really valuable to all of us on what what's a good way to engage with meditation and what can we um not, not what can we expect from it but what what should our goals be? What can be the benefits? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't think there's, I can't really name too many outcomes that meditation doesn't help. I mean, it's pretty, you know, there'll be people that say, oh, we still don't know if it, you know, reduces depression. It's like, oh, come on. Like, it reduces depression. You know, it does do a lot of things. The problem with meditation, there's two major problems in the public. Number one, nobody knows if they're doing it correctly. People are so worried about doing it correctly. It's like, eh, there's not really correctly. Because if you think about consumer-based apps for meditation, I don't know how many of the audience members have actually, you know, like 
tried one, but they're guided meditation. Someone talks for like most of it. So in the true essence of meditation, which is sitting in silence in a certain fashion, right? It's very different because somebody's talking, but we're still seeing outcomes based on using those things. So it's like, it's super powerful, right? So in other words, in other words, it's like, it doesn't matter if you sit there in silence and your brain goes and you keep going, oh, my brain's going, and you're like, okay, quiet it down. And then, oh, my brain's going, okay, quiet it down. Every time you're able to tell yourself quiet it down or come back to your breath, you're actually meditating. And so we're not doing a very good job of educating people about, like, you can just sit in a meeting and check in with your breath for three times and you're actually practicing mindfulness. You can still be listening and present, but you can be checking in with your body at the same time. So it's like, we, we just, we don't do a good enough job of educating people about that. And, um, and the other thing is that with meditation, there's nothing, it's, and we were talking about this yesterday, but there's nothing tangible. If I do five sit-ups, then probably tomorrow I might be able to do six, and I can count them. Five today, six tomorrow, oh, one more, perfect. If I meditate for five days in a row, there's nothing tangible to show me that I'm more mindful until you, like a month down the road, you go to the refrigerator and you're like, you go to open it and you're like, I'm actually not hungry. And you close the refrigerator and you walk away. And then you're like, holy crap. That was my meditation practice, <laughs> right? Like that's literally how it happens. And so we as a society want a reward right now, right now, right now, right now. That's it. So meditation is not the right now reward because you don't, I mean, I'll meditate and then patience is gonzo in two seconds with my child. And I'm like, I need to meditate again, <laughs> right? Like, but that doesn't mean I'm not doing good for my body when I'm practicing mindfulness been doing it for years it also means though that I can check in and go okay I'm losing it right now <laughs> bring it in right like so I think those are the biggest things is am I doing it right and where's the tangible benefit for me so if you can get people past that you're golden right and it doesn't matter if it's calm if it's headspace if it's YouTube if it's the planes overhead when you're sitting outside, it does not matter. Again, it's back to activity. What do you like? What do you want to do? What makes you feel good? Because that's going to help you build the habit. If I'm forced to listen to a voice that I don't like, that makes no sense, right? Or I need the voice because I'm not going to do it in silence. Again, it's like the N equals one kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you need? Just because the group says that's working, you know, that's I, a very long yeah. answer. No, so. I mean, I think it, it really speaks to not only individual variability, but also this notion that, you know, we really like formulas. We like steps and processes and just tell me what to do and how much and when and exactly how. And it's like, you have to figure it out part of that work, but also what you personally enjoy, like same with the physical activity, those different types, same with food and diet it's like if it's bringing you really true joy and you're like you're actually enjoying it that is um, a huge piece of health that I think is because it's so individual it's like people forget about it but it's like part of like what makes going to yoga versus going on a run versus going on a bike ride like more healthy for that person is because they love it <laughs> right or, or certain diets even it's like yeah um, there's one I forget he's like a I don't know if he's a jujitsu person or wrestling something. And um, he is like a world champ, like top of his class, like in just physical performance, like is absolutely elite. And he figured out for his body, like he's Italian and he only eats one meal a day and it's like pizza and pasta. And it's like this insane amount of calories, but it's like he is in, and he just loves it. Like he just enjoys it. And it's like, you know, he trains and he does all this, Crazy. but it's like, elite you know and it's because he just figured out what he loves and what works for him and it's like I just I love stories like that because it's like sure is that maybe you know if you were going to look at macros or what you know like the actual caloric breakdown of what that is maybe not the best but like for him that's what works and I just I love yeah. that it's like it's like listening to to your intuition mm -hmm. like we all have one so if we can tap into it that's what we should be following nothing wrong with that maybe, maybe that's one of the goals get to that expertise point where you're so in tune with yourself that you actually set your own sort of 
agenda That's right. of 100%. what because every I think every strength athlete or physical athlete will always say you have to understand your own limitations and get in touch with what works for you. And so you've really achieved something when you can sort of tailor that. And I was going to mention when you describe the outcomes, the challenging outcomes within meditation where it's so subjective, it very much reminded me of early psychology and the sort of as the 20th century was coming in, there was a lot of introspection where people would just think about the contents of their own mind and make observations. And that led to behaviorism in the US where everything was locked down and it had to be objectively observable, repeatable outcomes. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's the challenge with meditation. You can never get to, you can't study it as a behaviorist, right? Because there's no um, observable, re repeated element for every person. There, by definition, there's this subjective component to it. And I think psychology really found its way back to that over the course uh, to now, that we really value individual differences and sort of those insights that come about um, kind of within your own head. Yeah. And I think like practicing mindfulness doesn't necessarily have to be seated meditation either, you know, and so like the, the practicing mindfulness and getting back to like your intuition and that's how you do it through mindfulness practices. That's how you get there. But you can journal and be practicing mindfulness. You can walk in nature and be practicing mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's just that like, you know, you really have to be mindful. So going on a walk isn't mindful unless your phone's down, you're observing nature, like otherwise you're just in your head more and like you might as well stay home and be at your computer, right? Or, you know, like journaling or yeah, journaling, that's another example, right? But then again, if you're writing down a bunch of negative thoughts and how every, you know, what you don't like, that's not really going to get you. So, so, so mindfulness practices can work, but it's understanding the way that you want to use them. But that and meditation, all those things bring you back to that intuition so that you can follow suit of what works for you for exercise, for mm -hmm. diet, for all, for everything, for your social relationships. Yeah, and that's something that no one can tell you. You really just have to spend the time and, and figure it out. That's right. So it's that's challenging right. for a lot of people that are just kind of busy or in survival mode or just don't, you know, can't do it. Um, so. Yeah, and very worried. Like we're all this way in society, very worried about you know, what everyone else is doing and what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not following your intuition, let me tell you that much. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So I think we've set up a good number of topics. I'd love to open it up now to some audience questions. Um, so feel free to raise a hand and Christy's got a mic for you so that it'll pick it up. Okay. okay. So can you talk to like thinking about habit formation, adherence to the habits to get to formation, what is the role, importance, difference of incorporating into this, in, into like as you're learning things and trying to develop this habit, competition, desire for social community, like the social networks, or I would call it also maybe peer pressure, uh, positive and negative, and fun. So competition, fun, desire for social community. How does that, how, what, like, how does that yeah. all roll in? So number one, fun is going to be a very big contributor to, to habit setting, which is what I was talking about with like enjoyment. Like if you're having fun, you're going to want to do it. Like I love, love, beyond love going to yoga. I never miss because it's so much fun. I love my teacher too, let's be honest, but like that's, that's why I don't miss, right? I'm having fun all the time. Even when my body's like, I do not want to do this today, I'm still having fun um, in my own way of what fun is. <laughs> Sick and deranged. Just <laughs> um, competition, I think that's another, like that can be, you know, it, it just depends. It's again, like what, what drives you, right? So if you're being competitive with yourself and you're wanting to see like improvements and those kinds of things, then you would want to pick activities behaviors that are going to show you that you can do it better each time if that's what you thrive on right um, I would stay away from competing with other people because it has nothing to do with you um, and then um, the social engagement is huge so one of the biggest things is like and I've worked with women's health for years and like 
the biggest part of social support is not just like, oh, I have support, like I have friends. What I've talked about for years is having the ability to ask for what you need for support. And that's the biggest challenge that people have. Men and women, although I've w mostly worked with women about this, but it, it applies to men as well, is like, okay, I need this support so that I can be successful at this. It's like, well, have you, and they're not supporting me. Well, have you asked for the support? Have you, I would call it like ways that you access support, right? Like that was the only word I could come up with at the time when I was doing the research. But so we would literally in our group behavior change, I would have women sit down and write the conversation they're gonna have with their partner, their child, their parent. It's like, it's like intention setting. So you're setting up the conversation of how you want it to go, practicing it with this group of women, and then going out into the real world, and then doing it, executing it. And that would help and give relief to so many people because it was like, oh, I get it. I have to be accountable for my own support. I need them to do it, but I need to be accountable for telling them what I need and asking for it, taking ownership in what you need. So it's like, my husband knows I'm going to yoga. I also know that he bowls every Wednesday night for the past 14 years and before he met me. There is no, no buts about it. So that's it. That's his thing, right? But he has said to me from day one, I need your support in this. So I'm on kid duty unless I get a sitter. Um, but though I would say those, those are the things. Is the support is more about being accountable to ask what you need for the support. That's such a great shift and just, um, even like you said, with say discussion boards and someone kind of like they're reading it and we don't really know what benefit that is, but we know just even from kind of a brain perspective of like passive versus really active engaging with things. And I think I always sort of naively not really knowing um, that literature as much thinking about social support as like, yeah, to your point of just how many people do you have? Do you have people you can you could call if you need it, but like not actually, are you calling them? <laughs> are you telling them like what amount are you doing that? Um, and that we could nudge people to do that. I think that's, I'm like, whoa. <laughs> so uh, a theme that I hear coming through is initiation, mm -hmm. right? Whether or not it's initiation of communication, how do I reach out to my community mm -hmm. and ask for that support? Or if it's initiation of physical activity, how do I activate myself? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the brain, we often think about activation. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you had any insight on when we're dealing with mental health struggles, such as PTSD, severe depression, anxiety, and we have this kind of state of mind that is really inhibiting our ability to take that first step. We've had a wonderful discussion around, these people are already stepping, stick with it, love it, enjoy it, do it with others. For those of us that are struggling with taking that first step, what advice do you have? Yeah, I really appreciate your comment and your question because we never know people's stories and we have to be super compassionate about people. And so, so I love this comment. So, you know, um, one thing I would say is like, People, this is more on support. People identify with people who are like themselves. So if you can tap into resources of people who have at least, maybe not at the same space, but have been there to support people. So first it's extrinsic, like if you go be the behavior theory route, like there's extrinsic motivation that eventually turns to intrinsic motivation. And so in that situation, you're not going to have much intrinsic motivation because the brain is like, you know, not in a good space to have that. So one possible way is to take a person who has, that that person can identify with, who has had the same thing happen, struggles, etc. that is being, is, has ha had and having success and like, support them in doing that. So setting people up with others who are like them, it's like, so it's also theoretically, it's basically social cognitive theory because you're watching someone, you're seeing them, they're giving you verbal persuasion, you know, verbal approval, you see that they did it, you're like, oh, 
they're me, I'm them, they did it, oh, well, maybe I can do it, versus someone like me who comes into a group of women and I'm like, you know, start being a regular exerciser and they're looking at me like, all right, whatever, lady, like, miss, you have it together, you know, like, that's literally, you have to meet them where they're at and so sometimes, yeah, so, and I've worked with women with PTSD from very traumatic experiences and you have to meet them from their, the pit of their PTSD, like, you have to meet them there and acknowledge it and then say, okay, what's, like, the first baby step and I think identifying with someone who's had success that have things just like them is the best way to do it. And I don't know if this is, it's probably for each of you, because we talk about habits, and then we talk about someone like Daniel Pink, who's all about kind of nudges and nudging and, mm. and kind of getting, kind of pushing, maybe they don't even know they're getting pushed in that direction. Where do you see people really finding that's most sticky and effective, right? Because habit sounds a little bit mindless to me as the non-neuroscientist around here. So it, that almost seems false to me as opposed to, and I just read a book by Michael Singer called uh, Living Untethered. And mm. Dan mentioned it, kind of tapping into that inner self first. And it kind of goes with your meeting there. But wh where do you see in your commercial life things? What really sticks? Is it a habit or is it really finding that other intrinsic influence if you can get there so <laughs> um you know i i know like we all go with these like habit it's this very sexy term right now everybody's using it there's a, a good book a, i think it's atomic habits i've read bits and pieces of it but like i've been doing this for 20 years it's the same thing as like all the behavior change to get people to adhere like i have a lit review on how you get women to adhere to exercise. It's like, okay, well, habit is adherence. It's like, okay, that's fine. Let's call it habit in 2022. So that's that perspective there. So that's kind of what you're getting at. It's like, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, w on the industry side, we're selling. We're selling. So habit sells right now. The word adherence doesn't sell. <laughs> it's kind of very science <laughs> for all of us science people. So it's like you got to think about, you know, those things. So that's what's happening, you know, is that it sounds so great, but it really does come down to, you know, old school behavior change theory that everybody's like, oh, all that's outdated. And it's like, like self-determination theor theory and autonomy. Like we were talking about that yesterday in an app. You have to be able to have the autonomy. We want to be guided. Like we want to know like, okay, you have this, this score and this is what we're recommending for you. Of course we do. We're general population. We need guidance. We're asking for help. But also if I don't feel like that, I don't want to do it. If you want me to engage, so I need autonomy. I need to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that today, right? So that's a huge, huge part of that too is like being able to choose that's the enjoyment piece that's the what do I feel like today that's that I'm a human being and I'm not going to do the same thing every day when I first had babies my mother I would be like why is he doing this because he's a human being he's not going to be the same every day I'm like, you mean he's not like babies I, change it took me a while to be like okay Jen this is not a panic situation he's just a human being some days they have good days, some days they have bad days. I'm like, so it's the same kind of situation here, you know, tapping into that inner guidance, that, that's a big part of that too. One thing I was going to say, habit is a bit of a loaded term. So it brings up different associations for different people. Right. I think of smoking as a bad habit. You know, that was kind of mm. ingrained into my youth. Um, and also <laughs> I think of the neo habit system. As we all do when that <laughs> comes up, and that that's work of yeah. My my totally. mentor uh, Barbara Knowlton at UCLA had worked on this. It was, a, it was a paper in Science, so that stands out in my mind. I'm probably the only person, you know, in this hemisphere maybe, except for Barbara, that's thinking about that <laughs> regularly. But it, it was about this, and really, it was about intuition. That paper, you know, it was it was a a system in the brain that is almost mindless once you sort of build in the association it's the guidance it's that emotional sort of intuitive um guidance where you really don't even know where it's coming from it's kind of a highly you know deep brain um source of habit um you mentioned nudge which i think is a really uh it, that that term is also trendy 
in a different way and you can have environmental nudges mm -hmm. such as put the healthier food at eye level make the junk food on a lower shelf in the cafeteria oh, yeah. you know and, and it's just it's not telling you not it's not prohibiting you from buying it it's just making it you have to go out of your way now to make the worst choice. And so I think that fits a lot with what you talked about earlier, which is tr for exercise or, or any sort of physical um, betterment activity, try to build it into your day, your flow of your day, or add it on to some existing um, activity you're gonna mm -hmm. be doing. And so in that way, you're not having to build a new pathway within your brain that's like the mm -hmm. exercise pathway that's mm -hmm. hard to build from scratch mm -hmm. rather you're you're just able to use a a high a well-traveled highway mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're kind of having an a, mm -hmm. a easy to get to mm -hmm. off ramp that lets you sort of do something and then get back on and, and that's what nudges i think are about as well as it's like it's just a really subtle way of emphasizing this is this is a something you want to build in and it doesn't have to radically change yeah. your day, right? So, so maybe nudges, habits ultimately maybe are the effect of when a nudge works really well and we can follow it. So funny thing is nudges could also just be called like environmental cues. That's what we call them <laughs> in behavior change theory. Like it's a, it's a marketable word that sounds nudges sound way better than environmental <laughs> cues you can't even say the word environmental very easily <laughs> right like yeah so it's the same thing i put my shoes in my car so i always have walking shoes so if i get 15 minutes i can go for a walk right i um buy certain foods you know that like are here and and even i know what you're saying in like cafeterias and in other settings but like even at home like you know you put the ice cream and you only have a little and it's way in the back and or you don't buy it at all right like you just you're thinking uh, the one thing i used to give talks on this all the time and i would always have a slide and i would be like if anyone can figure out what room of that house this is you let me know right and it was like it was like supposed to be a gym but it was like a treadmill with clothes hanging on it and like <laughs> like there was nothing you know but you know a nudge would be like the bike's right there like it's set up, there's a TV, there's a fan, like you're all, it, it feels good, it looks good, there's a window, there's light, nobody puts any crud on it, like it's not a placeholder. Like those are just, you know, mm -hmm. similar things to like making it this, well, I wake up, I do this, I see my bike, I get on it, it's this traveled, pathway we need know? a treadmill alarm clock it's right next to your bed and you just, just right. walk <laughs> onto it and it starts moving right? right that, that was the ultimate nudge that's right exactly i'm gonna patent that so yeah no but it's just like it's kind of it's funny because it's we're just repackaging yeah the same i mean thing. we are being nudged all the time constantly everything environmental cues are everywhere whether they're intentional or not and i think what's interesting is seeing some behavior designers go in and look at things that were not intentionally designed one way, but this is kind of a simple example, but I think on the, the Google campus, one of the cafeterias, um, the way it was set up, it's like there was like a water drink station and one had like the snacks right next to it and one didn't. And it was like the snacking was way less for the people that weren't just right next to the food, right? It's like we as humans, we like the path of least resistance. Like we're about conserving energy, specifically brain energy, but you know, all, all around. And so it's like, what is the easiest path I'm going to take that? So the more you can set up your environment and kind of, I think you can create nudges or not, but know that if you're not creating your own nudges or setting up your environment, you're just going to be pushed along kind of like whatever that stream is. And we see this with social media, all these platforms, they're very good at knowing how we just get sucked into this path of least resistance. Um, and so it's just really whether those are nudges nudging you towards healthier behaviors or unhealthier, especially when it comes to mental health. And the path of least resistance exists in everything, right? So I'm gonna walk today or I'm gonna, you know, like go to this fitness class that I don't feel like going to. What's the path of least resistance? The path of least resistance is the walk, if that's what feels better, if that's what your inner being, inner intuition is telling you. The path of least resistance is following your intuition. That's what that is. So it's like, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, you know, someone a question and it's like, should I do this or should I do that? And then I'm like, oh, what's the path of least resistance? That's what I should do. Because that's following, you know, and that's probably going to get me better results. And so mm -hmm. we, we, we have to learn to do that better. And the other thing I'll say is that when we 
are thinking about the path of least resistance and identifying that or being aware that there is one and that we have this inner being that we can trust is that we are so, we, are, we have so many layers to get in the way of that. We, social media, you know, like pressure from work, like performance, FOMO, all these things, right? It's like they're just stacked and stacked and stacked and stacked. So if you don't practice mindfulness and things like that, how are you ever going to unstack those things? Mm -hmm. So you can figure out what the path of least resistance is for you. So you can get into habits that are supporting your positive lifestyle. It's impossible, right? So that's why those practices are so needed. Mm -hmm. It's for those people who like are definitely in, have chronic conditions. How do they get there? Right? They're so far down that road. Mm -hmm. Those practices help those people. Those are, the, those are the outcomes we're seeing modified in those ways. Okay. So I love the conversation about individuals. There's been so much to take away, but I'd love to switch the topic around to, to talking about how do you create some of that kind of habit change at a group level or at an organizational level. And the real question is, is what we just talked about what you would deploy or are there completely different strategies to consider? I mean, in a group-based setting, like so organizational level, it's like what um, Julie just mentioned, like the snacks are next to the water versus the water doesn't have snacks. So like, you know, I, I used to run interventions in, in schools and af after school communities. And so it's like the vending machines are off. Like, and also we need to get some of this out of the vending machines and that's policy related and difficult to do but it depends on the level of funding that comes in it's amazing what when funding comes in how many policies can change but like so tho those kinds of things so like I in a and and it's tough now on an organizational level because we have remote workers and so it's not like you come into an office and you're seeing these things like you know typically you'd see signage or right so like now it's like emails and and you know text messaging and things like that and let's be honest how many of us see the email and we're oh this is my cue to walk let's delete that you know like you know so it is difficult and people there needs to be more research on what organizational strategies work now in these hybrid and remote settings 110 percent but i would say the biggest one is that companies didn't need to give time they need to offer time. Everybody's big on PTO. How much PTO am I getting? Well, maybe companies could give like, and people are gonna kill me for saying this, but like a day less or two days less because they're spreading out, you know, 20 minutes every single day for the entire year for someone to take for a practice for themselves, the 20 minute walk where it's okay to have you know, whatever they're calling it, me time in their calendar that the company's saying like, and then you get to do whatever the company has purchased, right? Brain health, you know, meditation, walking, whatever it is, nobody can mess with that time. Everybody gets 20 minutes at their own. I'm, I'm making things up at this point, but like we're not doing a good enough job of doing those things especially in Zooming world where oh, I got to be on Zoom. I, I don't even have enough time to go to the bathroom most days, which I know you're all experiencing the exact same thing. So, so I would say there are some things, but like we need to do a better job in this, this environment for sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back a little bit to the topic of <coughs> habits that also line up with your intuition, but also I think in particular, I'm interested in habits like if you have part of a morning practice, routine, ritual, whatever you want to call it, that you feel like really helps set you up, right? To think at your best, to be at your best. Those things, those few practices where like, you know if you don't do them, right? You're just not, you're not yourself. I'm curious if you'd mind sharing what, what your morning practice is. So first of all, I love this comment because I am a firm believer in morning sets up the momentum for the rest of your day. And so when you don't have time to get up earlier in the morning to set up your day, you're, in my opinion, saying, I don't have time to take care of my own momentum today. And it's okay. It's not a bad thing. Some days I don't make the time for my momentum, but most days I do. So I wake up in the morning, and this is kind of a weird situation, but my two kids sleep on my floor a lot in sleeping bags, so I have to be like super quiet, whatever. So I'm like tiptoeing around them, 
and then brush my teeth, whatever. I come back into my bed. I use my headphones because it's really dark in there. And like, if I get up, the dogs follow me. It's a disaster. <laughs> and so I lay back in bed sitting, um, you know, with my legs crossed and I have my headphones on and I might listen to my meditation music or guided or nothing. But I sit in meditation for like 15 minutes. And then I um, go downstairs, I drink some water with lemon and I exercise, um, you know, basically, yeah, or do yoga, whatever I'm doing. So that's pretty much, oh, actually, I take that back. After I meditate, I journal for like five to 10 minutes on whatever came up for me in my meditation. Um, and if nothing really comes up, I try to just write a list of like all the things I appreciate, not gratitude, uh, not I'm grateful for, it's like appreciation. And then sometimes I'll do something like I intend to, and then I write a list of like all the things I intend to be. Like I intend to smile. I intend to love more. I intend to be patient. I like, m what are my intentions for the day? These are the practices that help set me up. And it's basically cause I'm, I'm personally choosing to live my life where I'm aware of my thoughts and the emotions that follow and choosing other thoughts. So my emotions stay on the positive side instead of the negative side. Not happy and sad. There's like a gazillion emotions on either side. So that's my morning practice. I'll say one other thing. The literature suggests that morning is the best time for habits. If we're talking about habit formation, the morning. So we've talked mostly about positive habits. Um, when you recognize that you have a habit that is not healthy for you, not healthy for your brain, um, is the best way to get rid of it by replacing it with a positive habit? Talk about getting rid of negative habits. Getting rid of negative habits. That's a that's an interesting question. So number one, I would try to take away the judgment of saying this is a negative habit. So like because as soon as we say this is a negative habit, we're not being kind to ourselves, right? That lacks compassion. Um, so like for me, like maybe a, I could, if I want to judge myself on a habit, like I always have a piece of dark, dark chocolate at night. And sometimes I don't even want one and I just do it out of habit. And I could save myself like a couple hundred calories a week <laughs> that way and use them for other things, right? <laughs> so like, but if I'm saying to myself, well, got to get rid of that negative habit. I'm not being kind to Jen, right? So I guess in this, this situation, I would say, like, I'm going to choose something else at that time. I'm going to choose a hot tea. I'm going to choose finding something to do. Um, I'm going to choose drinking a spin drift, <laughs> like, whatever, <laughs> you know? Like, um, so I think, number one, taking the, the, the judgment off of it that it's a negative thing, so accepting and loving the fact that, you know, still loving yourself, showing compassion for yourself, and then choosing something else. So are you speaking of something specific that you have in mind? No. Yeah, so I would just say like, and I know this is difficult, like you're probably talking about maybe like a smoking habit, maybe, right? Like that's a little bit different because there's could be addiction, you know, obviously to nicotine, but again, if you beat yourself up about the fact that you're smoking, you're in a bad place to start. Like, okay, appreciate that you're aware that this is no longer serving you. And then choose the first step. Okay, this is no longer serving me. I smoke, you know, a pack of cigarettes a day. I'm gonna take myself to half a pack a day. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's like baby steps, there's this like 10,000 steps a day. I, I'm not gonna tell you to take 10,000 steps if you do 2,000 on average. It's a recipe for a disaster. So choosing something else that serves you better. Less cigarettes serves you better than more cigarettes. I think that the power of cues is really important here as well. So mm -hmm. oftentimes a whatever activity it's gonna be, good or bad, however you wanna judge it, it's, it's kind of like there are things in your environment that set up having the chocolate now or having the cigarette now. And I, I recall a, an individual had struggled with alcoholism saying what he started to do is is just drink water whenever he would normally have a drink he would just drink water and that was like satisfying sort of this motor cue of sort of consuming something um, and I've heard similar things with um, people trying to quit smoking is that you know something 
that they, if there's anything they can do actively in place of when That's they right. might have a cigarette, That's it's right. it's almost like it's a way of baby stepping down from the habit where you're still, you're not just stopping behavior, you know, absolutely without any, um, you know, just cold turkey, but it's um, just a way of maybe moving the pathway off toward an, you know, sort of offering like in my in my my highway analogy like there's now an off ramp that sort of you can gracefully take um to to eliminate that and I, I think also just environment is so powerful so if you you know move locations or just even go to a hotel for a while you're just not going to have available those same routines and so you you know, again, it goes back to you can somewhat construct your environment in a way that it doesn't, it makes it harder to reach mm -hmm. for that bad habit mm -hmm. that you want to break. Mm -hmm. There's um, some science around breaking, you know, forming new habits, bad habits. Are, so I know something a lot of people struggle with, especially younger people, is like I'm constantly just reaching for my phone. Like I get the spare second and then it's just like I'm just grabbing for it, even when it's not going off or whatever that looks like, or I'm trying to focus at work and it's just on the desk and I just, um, and so to like in that moment once you've done the habit and you recognize it, and you're like oh shoot i just grabbed my phone for no reason <laughs> and i'm trying to focus and then immediately kind of changing it like you said replacing it with something else so it's like it's okay if you actually like you had the chocolate and you were like shoot i didn't actually want to have the chocolate maybe this breaks down with food but um so with back to the phone example but like then saying okay instead i want to just um it, maybe it's that I'm stressed and I just need a break, so I just need to stand up from my chair instead. And then you, you actually do that. And so it's kind of like this idea of that, that neural pathway is active because you just did it. And then kind of doing the preferred behavior immediately after when that network is still active helps to kind of reform that. Um, so I thought that was sort of a, a neat way to think about like exactly. So when it happens, you don't beat yourself up for it, right? You instead just say, okay, I realized I did it. I want to do this instead. And you do it. And that helps to kind of over time change that. I think that goes along with neurophysiology. You know, we, I think of dopamine. Like people t say, I want the head of dopamine. I'm going to look at my phone. And, and dopamine used to be thought of as a pleasure-related neurochemical, and uh, it is. It signals reward, but then over time, it doesn't signal reward anymore. It signals the cue that predicts the reward, mm -hmm. and then it begins to signal when the reward doesn't follow, and then you're on the way to sort of breaking out of that behavior. So I think we can rely on the, the flexibility, you know, the plasticity of our brains that um, they, they are tuned up in however way we live our life, but we can always pivot. And the brain is, we're foragers. You know, we have a forager mm -hmm. mammal brain at the end of the day, and it, it, you start to get into really simple things that are gonna drive behavior um, it doesn't have to be all that sophisticated. It's just kind of like take away the cues that are going to lead to the behavior you, you want to extinguish or promote. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't actually know what time we started, um, but I think it's 10.35 maybe. So maybe a good point to wrap up and sort yeah. of say what our takeaways are. Yeah, final. Oh, do we have one more question? Yeah. Just, just one more. The, have any of y'all done a lit review or otherwise seen research when we talk about these things that we're trying to deliver to people, right? To make their lives better. What's the strongest motivator? Fear? Vanity? Positivity? What, in other words, because these commercial companies are tapping into something, is there a review on what is more motivational to say, if you do this, yay, or if you don't do this, something bad's gonna happen? Or, or have, yeah. Are there I mean, any generalities I to be drawn I haven't seen a lit review on this, but I will say, I kind of mentioned this yesterday in my talk, is like, if you, they, everybody has a problem. If you are going to solve their problem, they're signing up. Doesn't mean you're going to solve it, and doesn't mean they're going to use it, but if they think that there's potential, that, then that you'll solve their problem, and also they have to be somewhat at a certain level of readiness to change. Um, so preparing, cont contemplating at the very least, like maybe, you know, I could do better with taking care of my health. Uh, I don't know if I want to. Uh, maybe I do. That's when you go on, you, you click the app, and you do the seven-day free trial, right? <laughs> like, um, and then if you're more into preparation and, and like, action, then you, you're going to pay and, and maybe use it, maybe not. But again, the, the readiness, but also, like, uh, you have a, 
um, solution to my problem. So you mentioned fear, which I think is really interesting because I would say that that is probably one of the strongest motivators. Now, do you want to tap into that? But I think that also then brings up this idea of emotion and that we are not actually, as we like to believe, as rational as we think, right? We think we're these like rational, um, and Dan can speak a lot more to this than I can, but um, we are really driven by emotion. So it's like that emotion of like, I have this problem and I need help or this can solve it or how, how I'm going to feel when I do that. That I think is our biggest driver of all behavior. Now we have a frontal lobe, so we can inhibit that or we can choose a different path, but it's a lot harder. Like we truly are, um, emotion is the first kind of gut instinct. It taps into this intuition idea a little bit. Um, I don't know, I'm sure there's a whole path of literature for each of those and teasing them apart. Um, but yeah, I think being able to, as a, as a whole kind of, and, and you see this with like different brand affiliations and want, you know, like this, I'm kind of identifying with the type of person who does this or looks this way or feels this way, um, or I feel this way when I am seen, seeing myself as this type of person. Um, so yeah, I think emotions are tapping into those and we, we experience it all the time in everything we do. And especially even just looking at like, just even in, in COVID or in big, like big kind of events that really shape, shape people. Um, I mean, you just see so much of that, like the toilet paper thing with it, you know, it's just like, what's, like people are just in fear and they're not rationally thinking like, is toilet paper the thing that we really need right now? Right? Like it's just a classic <laughs> example of that. Well, I, I guess it could, Jen is an expert on like customer discovery, know your customer, right? That that's um, so important because in your own head, you've got this perfect story of how you've created this wonderful thing that you're going to give to the world and they will all, <laughs> all be fans of it right away. And that's not often the case. You know, it's it's just our, our, um, our own expectations. Um, it, are never going to fully align with the world around us. So you have to constantly get the feedback, right? It's get data is really often the answer. And I think there's, there's often a, a, a gap between kind of like the conscious mind and the brain, right? The learning brain and apps probably feed the learning brain, right? And then, you know, it's just kind of like basic reward or, or fear of punishment drive a lot of our behaviors. And then we interpret it with, with our conscious mind and, um, I guess really the packaging makes a huge difference. What's going to hit most of the people most of the time there. All right. Well, let's kind of wrap up with our closing summaries or biggest takeaways. Um, mine, mine kind of comes with a question, so I'm going <laughs> to um, pose it. But I think my biggest takeaway is just this idea of wanting to help people kind of connect with this more intuitive self in terms of making better health choices. And so is meditation mindfulness like one of the best ways to do that? Are there other ways? And especially when we think about at a more organizational level. Um, anyway, that's just, that's something I want to be noodling on, but I don't know if you have a response to that. Yeah, I mean, 100%. I think, um, you know, you talk about emotions and awareness and intuition, and these are all things that, that we all have the ability to do but we're so deep in all the things that are happening and we're so externally focused. And so the mindfulness and the meditation practice brings us inwards. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll say just like completely randomly, that's why this psychedelic thing is going crazy. Um, and is because the psychedelics get rid of your logical mind and you're able to tap into what you're inner being is telling you mm. it's like and I'm talking about it in therapeutic fashion not in recreational fashion I'm not promoting anything like that but that's why therapeutically it's blowing up if you will mm -hmm. is because it's people don't know how to get there they're still looking for the answer and not enough people want to talk about emotions what they are not just happy and sad how do you get to a different emotional space it's too scary and it's not in the behavior change box. Mm -hmm. There's no framework for it. Like I have actually a podcast and that's all we talk about is living our real lives in this place of being emotionally aware so you can um, have different thoughts and get what you want out of things. So I 110% agree with 
yeah. everything you're saying. It's so important. Depression, PTSD, anxiety. It's the, it's, that's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll definitely link to your podcast so that people can check oh, that out. Sure. Um, yeah, Dan, what are your closing thoughts? I think we got into a lot of interesting terrain in this discussion, and, and it makes me think of how life is like a big time sharing exercise where you need to make time for physical activity, interacting with the world socially, but also reflecting within one's own mind and you know structuring your your environment in a way that that you succeed at these different elements within your day because if you do any one of them too much you start to develop an unrealistic sense about the world or you're getting too much feedback from the world and not mm -hmm. processing it well so I, I think that really is important to, to stay balanced and everything in moderation um, another really interesting takeaway, I go back to early in the conversation about meditation, like when we had talked about what would be the outcomes, and you, you had said very accurately, you, you, don't, you don't have <laughs> clear outcomes, right? You're, it's you reflecting and, and processing information within your own head, and it's unrealistic to think that it's a, there's a goal to hit, right? And, right? and I think that's an excellent way to think of it. And it, it gives me some, um, some hope that I might be doing it somewhat correctly if there is such a thing. <laughs> because it doesn't feel the same every day. And it's That's maybe right. just engaging the practice to. is you've won. Right? Right. If, you, mm -hmm. if you did it, yeah. if you made time for it, you have succeeded. And I think I, I take some, um, some heart in that because I think everyone ha has different experiences when we do that. I love that. I just <laughs> made me think of it. Uh, I don't know if it was a Twitter quote or something I saw where they're like, I just listened to a mindfulness, like a, a meditation on twice the speed or like, you know, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> we're missing the point. Like, oh that's my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> it, it was, it was a joke, but um, yeah. Jen, do you have any final thoughts? Um, I would just say like, I love what you said, everything in moderation. I think with all of these things, like you don't have to c become this emotional awareness guru and like, let it suck up your life. And you know, you don't like, and you don't have to go out and ask everybody that you know to support you in something that you want to do. Like, there's a happy medium, you know. Mm -hmm. You always have to think of it as an N equals one. What's working for you? What feels good to you? Tapping into that intuition and using these practices that we know that um, are helpful for us doing that will, will lead to behavior change, 100%. It will lead to natural habits, um, paying attention to cues, being aware of them, and um, yeah. This has been so awesome. Thank you so much, Jen, for being on. Sure, and thank you, thank you to our audience for your awesome questions. Yeah, thank you. Right. <laughs>